Welcome, Tina. Would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself and then we'll take some time for question and answers. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lori. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's nice to hang out with um, a bunch of progressives from Silverton. It's lovely to see you tonight. I'm Tina Kotek. I'm zooming in from my home office in North Portland. Um, as many of you know, I was Speaker of the Oregon House for nine years. I was in the legislature for 15. I'm now um, an Oregon voter and a civilian, as it, as it were, and a candidate, Democratic candidate for governor. I'm running for governor because given everything that's coming at us, and crises that are facing us, I think it's really important that we have a experienced progressive leader as our next governor. I believe I have shown through my work as speaker that I have a track record of getting things done to improve the lives of Oregonians. And I think that's really important right now. Um, it's incredibly important to solve problems, bring people together and, and move our state forward, but also protect the uh, progressive things that we've done in the state from raising the minimum wage to protection, protecting access to abortion, to uh, putting us on a path to 100% clean electricity by 2040. Those are things that I have championed. I want to make sure we hold on to those things and continue to, you know, take on our biggest challenges, recovering from this pandemic in a way that we lift up everybody and there's opportunity for, for, more, for more folks. Uh, making sure we address our housing and homelessness crisis, continue to make progress in, uh, on climate, and then also making sure that, particularly in our healthcare system, people have access to the mental health and substance abuse treatment that they need. Um, many of you know, particularly the pandemic has shown a lot of things have been tough and our system is not meeting the need when someone is ready to seek out care, it needs to be ready and available um, in their communities when they need it. So those are some of the priorities for me and uh, I look forward to your questions and I hope you can get excited about su supporting me as a Democrat in this primary. It's, um, it's going to be a very interesting election year. So I'm, I don't know, um, Lori, will you be moderating or should I be just calling on folks? I can um, call on people that have questions. So. Raise your hand, do the, okay, Charles, go ahead. I don't know if I have so much a question uh, for Tina, but uh, I want to relate uh, an experience that we had this week with her. Uh, as many of you know, I am a board member of Power Oregon in, uh, in Portland. And one of my uh, colleagues on board uh, met with Tina on Monday to present to her uh, the uh, energy policy simulator that we have developed for the state in preparation for developing a, uh, power, a um, energy uh, plan for the state. We sent that to uh, Tina and uh, she not only read it, but when she came to the meeting with Eric, uh, she was prepared with questions and uh, was uh, very articulate in uh, understanding uh, the nature of the work that was going on and uh, its usefulness to the state of Oregon. And uh, to me, that represented a really important uh, picture of a leader, a political leader, which we badly need in the executive office in Oregon. So as a result, Power Oregon is all in with Tina uh, we are completely uh, going to support her, and I'm urging everyone in the Silverton Progressives to join us in uh, matching our contributions and uh, our work on her behalf. So thank you, Tina, for being a candidate and being articulate and uh, serious about the issues. Thank you, Charles. I, I very much appreciate that, and I'm, I am spending my free time playing with the simulator. It's super, super interesting. And I think going to be an absolutely valuable tool because we have to continue to make progress and we have to know where we're going um, to know for actually, you know, getting the job done. So thank you. Appreciate you a lot. And Power Oregon. Dixon, you have a question, go ahead. 
I do. I know I was being teased earlier for coming to a progressive meeting because, uh, but um, just, you know, for the record, I traditionally registered as a, a de uh, Democrat to vote in the primaries. Um, but I wanted to ask Tina, I, I guess I, my first thought would be, I want to make a, what I believe, and uh, I believe very strongly that if somebody wins an election 51 to 49, it doesn't mean two things to me. One, it doesn't mean that there's a mandate just because somebody got 51%. And it doesn't mean that the 49% don't count. I have a personal belief that the extreme right and the extreme left are what are hurting us most in politics, whether it's locally or nationally. And um, I really believe that for me, the candidate that is going to, to really strike home with me is somebody that can actually do br bridge building uh, because I, I have a lot of friends in Eastern and Central and Southern Oregon and they have very different beliefs about, you know, Portland controlling. Um, Portland and Eugene and, um, you know, kind of controlling what happens in uh, politics in Oregon. So I guess what my question is, what, what can you do specifically to really bring people together at a time in my 69 years, I've never seen us more divided. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. Um, I do think that we are very divided. I, I and I think it's an actuality and also kind of a self-affirming perception, depending on the information you get, right? And I think we have a lot of things working against us um, in ways of, we're not coming together. We have things pushing us apart. There are a lot of things going on. Um, certainly the pandemic hasn't helped. Just your inability to be in community and see each other, I think just puts people further in their kind of own little worlds. Um, as governor, it's going to be really important to make sure you go out and have that, that those interactions. Um, I want to be outside of Salem. I want to be in community with people around the state and listen to them. I fundamentally believe, and this is how I acted as speaker, we're a stronger state when all parts of the state feel included, have a pathway to success and opportunity, and it's hard. Not every community is equally situated. But we have to do what we can as leaders to bring the whole state together. And as speaker, I took my job very seriously as representing the entire state, not just my district in North Portland. I made sure that my 59 other colleagues, regardless of their party, could be successful for their districts. I don't like anyone feeling like they're left behind. I've been an advocate for 20 plus years. I want to focus on things that we have in common, even if the solutions might look a little different in certain communities, but we all have a housing problem. We're all worried about access to healthcare, worried about our schools. There are those things that I think if we focus on those commonalities and solve problems together, we're gonna, we're gonna build trust. And that's what the next governor has to do. That's what I plan to do. And um, look, I'm not gonna get every vote. But when I win this race and become the next governor, I'm the governor for the entire state. This isn't about, you know, there's no mandates involved here. It's like, look, elections, pick someone to lead, but they are leading for the entire state. And I take that job very seriously. And um, I'm hoping the pandemic will allow for the, you know, people coming back together and having dialogue in a way that I think will help solve some of that division. And it's gonna take all of us to do that. I do think that on the left and the right, you know, you got your really hardcore folks, but there are a lot of people just like, look, can't we just figure this out? I'm in the like, can't we just figure this out um, and solve problems together? That's that's the kind of approach I'm going to bring to my my term as governor. Thanks, Tina. And Shola Swans, I see you just joined us and I'm happy to see you. And we're just doing a Q&A with Tina now. So if anybody has a question, just raise your hand or do the raise hand. Uh, and we will call on you. Uh, Lee, you have a question? I, I do. <laughs> Tina, I was on the PNHP, Physicians for National Health Program call last night, and you did a really good job in front of all of those 
physicians from around the state that are supporting a universal health care system. And my question was the one where it was asked, um, uh, as governor, uh, if you got a bill on single payer health care, would you sign it? And you did. You said that it would depend on, on the content, of course, but that you assumed that if it got through the legislature, uh, it might be a bill worth signing. And so there is a possibility that would happen. Since one of the people on the joint um, task force on universal health care, Chuck Sheketoff, is here, and um, there, a lot of certified smart people that you know, like Bruce Goldberg, are working on this task force that's worked for almost two years now and will be coming up now by May 19th, which is my brother's birthday. Um, they're going to have a revenue plan and how much it's going to cost figured out by LRO and a lot of smart people. And by this summer, they're going to have a design to start sharing with the public, with healthcare professionals, with uh, businesses, and they're going to get input. And hopefully, by the time you're governor, uh, we might actually have that bill coming along with a lot of smart pe people doing it. Um, what I and and you showed some knowledge. You 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 mentioned that the ERISA is one of the barriers to getting rid of. Um, employer-based health care in this country, and that the federal laws are influencing what we're able to do. And this is what that task force is wrestling with. But my question is now, what would your vision of a universal health care system that you'd be willing to pass look like? Oh, wow. Great question. Well, thank you. Um, I was real worried you were going to try to come back on that Medicare question I couldn't answer last night. So uh, there was, it was a very wonky set of questions there. But, um, and thank you for everyone who has been, frankly, laboring for years to kind of move us step by step towards uh, an implementation of a universal healthcare system. We need to get there. I mean, if, if someone dropped out of the sky, you know, from another planet tomorrow and looked at how we try to provide healthcare in this country, they would all be like, this doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, rationally, why do we do it this way? Um, so I am looking forward to those recommendations. For me, I go back to, is it a system that people can get the care they need when they need it? I, I always go back to the consumer. Um, and often when we talk about changes in healthcare or anything at the state, I'll be like, okay, so tell me how this actually works for the person. Um, I mentioned last night for, for the first time, I had to actually go on the health insurance exchange for my family to figure out how to do health insurance. And I, honestly, I should have been on it before to kind of, but until you actually have to do it, you're like, wow, this is, some of this works, some of it doesn't. So that universal access to care, that universal health coverage that we're hoping to move towards has to really serve the person to have the preventive care, the, uh, the care when they need it so they can live uh, a healthier life. And I also said last night, I don't think health is just about health care. That is certainly one component of it. That's why I care so much about housing. That's why um, I care so much about um, education because the research has shown you have solid housing and you, you, know, you have a solid education. That's also a health factor for you. And so, um, so I just want, you know, I'm, if we just focus on getting access to healthcare, I think we're missing the, you know, a part of the story. But for me, it's gonna, to get back to these questions, I'm going to ask, what does it mean for the consumer? Um, and that's that will be, you know, the filter which I will look through. And does it serve the consumer well? And does it do it sustainably? You know, there's cost involved in this system. There's cost involved in doing anything. Is it sustainable? Will it actually pencil out? So serves the consumers well, and is it sustainable? Those will be the probably the two leading questions I would ask when I, you know, when we see the next. Um, the modeling is going to be important. Because it's got to work if we're going to try it. So, thanks, Tina. And I know it looks like Dixon has his hand up, but he said Brianna is actually the one asking the question. So, Brianna and then Carissa. Oops. Hey, can you hear me? Hi, I'm Brianna. Um, I Dixon's my dad. Um, he's just on my couch eating dinner with my kids and I. <laughs> Um, I am in my early thirties. I'm part of a like younger moms group. Sorry, it's loud here. Younger moms group in Silverton. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a registered Democrat, have always voted Democrat, but I'm currently undecided. Um, this is Lucy. Say, can you say Lucy. hi? Hey. Currently undecided um, in the governor. Okay, stop. 
currently undecided. Um, so I guess my question is why why you? I mean, we've I can rule out most of the Republican candidates, but when I have the choice between Democratic candidates, why why would um, younger progressive moms be encouraged to vote for you? Yeah, thank you for the question. Well, again, it goes back to the reason I'm doing this work. It's I've always been an advocate and a fighter for people. This is about making things better for Oregonians. Um, you know, chuckled over this from that's how we know each other. 20 years ago, I started my work at Oregon Food Bank. And what I learned doing that work, it's, it wasn't about the food. It was about not having a good paying job. It was about not being able to afford your housing, ha having medical debt for, because 20 years ago, a lot of people didn't have any access to health insurance or, and so they had something go wrong. They were in debt forever. Um, and that was, you know, uh, leading them to have to go get an emergency food box. So for me, I've been at this 20 plus years, even before I got elected. And for me, it's always about making things better for individuals and for their families. I've worked on childcare. I think for our, our young parents who have struggled in the last two years um, to make sure, you know, not having their kids in school or not having access to childcare if they were trying to work, um, really huge issue for me. I think it's very important to make sure we take this opportunity with the more help coming from the federal government and the creation of a new uh, early learning agency at the state of Oregon, that we finally make that next great leap forward to make sure our working parents have access to more affordable quality early learning opportunities and childcare. And childcare that's not just eight to five, childcare they can get on the weekends or, um, or if they're working a swing shift. I believe we're at that point where we can really move forward. I've been a big advocate over the years for our program that helps working parents uh, provide uh, assistance to cover their childcare. But the biggest challenge right now is we have childcare providers who left during the pandemic. We need to get them back. We need to make sure we have capacity. So there are childcare deserts in communities around the state. Um, you know, we have places that have no infant and toddler care uh, to speak of. We have to do a better job there. So. For young families, I'm going to be an advocate for childcare. I'm going to be an advocate for making sure you have access to the health care you need for, for your families. And, and I think bottom line, compared to the other candidates, I know how to get things done. I have moved progressive pieces of legislation year after year in the Oregon legislature by bringing people together, people impacted by the conversation and impacted by the results of not doing anything or in, you know, in the middle of providing the services themselves and saying, how do we fix this? Identifying the solution and then putting it into practice. The reason I wanna be governor is at some point, there's always so much you can do in the legislature. We have put, for example, a paid family and medical leave insurance program, one of the strongest ones in the country. I helped negotiate that deal and it's not ready to go yet. I wanna make sure that gets done. And I wanna make sure it gets done right for families who are going to need that. Um, this is about implementation for me. I want to be the CEO of our state so stuff will work. That's why I'm running for governor. And based on what I've worked on, I think you have a good idea of what are the things I want to work on. And now I guess do I want to do it as governor to make sure we can get things to, to frankly happen. Thank you. And I really appreciate the question. Thank you. Carissa, uh, Chuck, and then Nassim. Carissa, you're up. Um, first, I want to say I love the picture that you have in the background. Thanks. You're a Wonder Woman picture. Um, and then I am super excited to vote for you. I can't uh, think of running that is more qualified at this point. Um, but my question is, for anybody that's following COVID in the European countries that have a far higher vaccination rate than we do, um, quite frankly, Marion County isn't even at 70% for second shots out of the three shot series. Uh, so now that we're no longer requiring masks, when cases inevitably, inevitably go up, um, what, is, what is your plan for that? Because cases are on the rise in European countries that are far more vaccinated than we are. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and we're gonna be in this for a while. Um, I think it's very important not to lose any momentum and continue to encourage Oregonians to get vaccinated and boosted. Um, I, what I'm hearing from the Oregon Health Authority right now is they're not letting up. They're going to continue to work with community partners to provide access. We're all going to, I think, have to uh, increase the public outreach campaign to remind people why that's important. Because um, if we don't continue to increase our vaccination rates, 
we're going to see more variants. Um, and we're going to have this up and down, up and down uh, until, um, you know, we just have the ability to keep those variants at bay. And that means more people vaccinated. And certainly still waiting for, you know, full review by the FDA for certain age ranges. Um, but adults, um, I think, you know, it is safe and hopefully people are gonna get vaccinated. And I think as the next governor, I will continue to follow the science and the experts on how to do that and make sure that we're learning something from this pandemic. We're, look, when this whole thing started, we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, nobody did. There was no playbook. We have learned how to engage communities differently, particularly communities who are disparately impacted by this pandemic. You're, I mean, Marion County is a good example. Your um, numbers are still very high for that next community of not being vaccinated or having you know, higher prevalence of COVID. We have to do better there. Um, and the good thing is I think we've learned some things along the way over the last two years and we have to keep it up. Um, I know people are gonna take their masks off. I personally will probably keep mine on in the grocery store to keep workers safe. And uh, we just should be ready and continue to do everything we can as members of this broader community called Oregon to do our part to keep each other safe. And, and I do believe that is more people getting vaccinated and boosted. We really need to keep up that, that drumbeat. Thank you, um, Chuck, and then Nassim. Hey, Tina. Um... So this tax season, we're spending almost $2 billion with the bulk of it going to the wealthiest Oregonians in the form of a tax cut um, called the kicker because the forecast error was off by 2% or more and was off by a lot more than that. And That's pretty volatile, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, we're, and the legislature um, most recently, and then when you were uh, speaker never voted to spend those $2 billion and they, they, they're able to avoid doing that. And Oh, you're on mute. With the only times that we've um, ever had the legislature override it, it's often been led by the governor. It's been led by the governor. And so, you know, we're currently eight months into this biennium and they're already projecting almost a billion dollars bulk of which will go to the wealthiest Oregonians. And I'd like to know whether you intend to lead on stopping that wasteful spending. Well, I, I appreciate the question. You know, in hindsight, I wish when we at, at the ballot voters had decided to redirect the corporate kicker to education that we had also had that conversation about the personal income tax kicker at the same time, because I think we might have solved it way back when. Um, <laughs> I think the hard challenge right now is, and one thing you should know about me is, I'm gonna be really direct and pragmatic about what is achievable. Right now, we have strong reserves in the state. We've done a great job over the last decade, putting money aside, building rainy day funds, making sure we have money set aside. And in this pandemic, we've seen substantial new revenue coming in, um, which the last legislature just met last month, you know, I spent over a billion, you know, allocated over a billion dollars to do really important things in our communities. I think it would be very difficult because as you know, with it's a, I think Chuck, it's a constitutional change, right? So it would, it is not, it's statutory. Well, to over, well, to override the current ones not is- uh, Correct. Mm -hmm. The legislature can do it, but they need to at least have a vote and show where they stand on that spending. Gotcha, right. So to change the overall, um, how the personal kicker, that would be a constitutional change. But right, there is an override potential given the this, this situation. I think it would be very difficult. I don't think it makes sense to put it out there just for the sake of having a vote. I, but as governor, if we're in a financial distress like we were during the Great Recession, where we had to have that conversation because we were looking at cutting, well, as we did, billions of dollars out of our state budget, then I think we'd have to have that conversation if reserves weren't adequate or something else was going on. Because if doing that forecast is really challenging, as you know. I think it's a very hard conversation to have when the state has more revenue than I have ever seen in its coffers. Um, and that's, I think that makes it for a very hard conversation. So I, I don't think we just do it for performative. We have to do it because it's, we're doing it for a reason. And right now we just, we're doing well on the revenues and we're not in a budget crisis. 
I think that's the only time you have to bring it up to actually get the votes for it. It is not a simple thing to do. Okay, uh, Nassim and then April. Can you hear me? Yes. So I'm gonna tag on to Chuck for a second. We have a rainy day fund. We need a drought day fund. We've got farmers and ranchers who are suffering. 75% of the state is in extreme drought still. Um, I think part of the state's problem is this rural urban divide that people see us focusing mostly on urban issues. Um, and I know homeless touch list touches all our communities in one way or another. And I know mental illness touches one way or, uh, all of our communities in one, in, in one way or another, but so does our climate. And I think it's very nice to think that we can attack it from the cause issue, but I think we need to be setting aside our reserves so that farmers can continue farming, fishermen can continue fishing, and um, people can continue to have water when they open up their, 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 their taps. And so I think that it does need to be looked at as we need a reserve because climate is changing and we're gonna be experiencing more fires and more drought. So that's my thought is that it could be sold. So yeah. under that. Um, what I wanna know is kind of more broad. Um, what can, what, how will your administration be different than the previous democratic administrations that I used to cover as a reporter? I've heard all the same kind of goals and values, but how are you gonna function differently than Kate Brown or John Kidshopper? I think every, um, and by the way, Nassim, I agree on the drought. I mean, that's why we set aside, and it wasn't everything, but we made a set aside in the 21 session for $100 million for some of these immediate needs on drought, but there is a bigger issue out there. And it would be an interesting conversation to say, what if we set aside a portion of the kicker for a substantial fund to deal with our drought issues because climate change is here. So not only do we have to work hard to make sure it doesn't get any worse and we're gonna do its part, we are now going to have to have dedicated resources for mitigation and prevention for drought and fires and other things and protecting people in their own homes that they have air conditions and things to address the radical changes we're gonna see in climate. So we are now, it has begun, we are spending money for mitigation as well as the long-term prevention of making sure it doesn't get any worse. In terms of other administrations, um, you know, everybody brings their own skill set um, to the central office in the building for the, as a governor. For me, um, what I've seen serving under several governors now and actually working as an advocate before I was elected is, um, I think it's about what you focus on and how you do your business. As governor, um, first of all, I'm going to tell voters, here's my track record. I know how to do things. And why I've been able to do that is I build great teams. I bring great staff to work on very critical issues. I'm going to review everybody who's been leading agencies and state government, making sure that they are up for the task for the next four years to make sure government is functioning at its highest level. For me, it's um, we haven't had a governor, truly, 100% focused on housing. I'll be releasing a housing plan here soon that's going to talk about what we have to do as a state over the next decade to meet our housing needs. And it is substantial. And we're going to all have to do it together. So I think it's about, I'm going to be different than Governor Kitzhaber and Governor Brown with my focus on housing. And I think I'm going to be, in some ways, more focused on how the executive branch functions than what the legislature does. Look, I've been a legislative leader for nine years. It's been an absolute privilege. But I would like to spend a lot more time talking about how our government is actually functioning. Because what we saw in the pandemic, things weren't working that great. We have to do a better job. And that's going to take management. And that's what I want to spend my time on. Thank you. Uh, Nassim, Thanks. And I know it says April's phone, but it looks like Tom. So Tom, do you have a question? Tom, have a All right, hi. Yeah, this is Tom Newton. Um, so kind of piggybacking on the theme. <clears throat> uh, one of the things that is a challenge in our state is that ranch, a lot of farmers use a lot of water and uh, actually a lot of ranchers use water, I think. And there's a lot of concern that uh, 
water consumption affects the fish populations <clears throat> and it pits the farmers against the fishermen. Uh, and how, and then there's crops are compromised or the fish populations are compromised. Uh, you, that is a significant issue for a lot of the voters in the state. How do you visualize addressing that? Yeah, well, one of the, yeah, things, well, I, one of the things I, oops, one of the things I did as speaker is I created a water committee. Um, I've been supporting Representative Helm's work for a couple years now about what we do about overall water policy in the state, around understanding how water is used, how we plan for it, how we plan for um, our um, groundwater here in the state. Um, and we've been putting money through my support by any name over by any name to kind of build up this infrastructure, really understanding where we are in water right now, not just understanding we're in a drought. Um, on the fish side, this is a climate issue, right? As the water gets warmer, it's not only less water, water is warmer because it's lower or because the temperatures are, you know, with um, changing in weather and our fish are dying. And so we have a lot of complex issues. As the next governor, it's gonna be really important to bring some very fractured conversations to a single table and say, look, we have a very strong natural resource industry in Oregon, agricultural, forestry, fish, all these things are very important to who we are as Oregonians. We have to get a handle on the water issue. We have to be honest about, we have to understand who's using what and really have a harder conversation about, you know, we have this traditional structure of water rights and who, had, who can do what. It's not working. And again, the climate is changing. We have to get serious about this if we want to have a natural resource sector for, you know, the next generation. And again, I go back to who's leading our agencies, who's in my office staffing, who in the private sector wants to step up, be, step up and be part of this conversation. This is not just going to be solved by the public sector. We really do need to have everybody pulling on board. And I think as we've been seeing, water is going to be a huge issue um, over the next four to five years. And I feel like we're at that cusp of having done a lot of the, the preparatory research, but we have a lot more we need to do and have hard decisions about how we come together as a state to manage our water use. Thank you. Tina, I don't know how long we have with you. Um, I could do 10 more minutes. I got to go at 715. Okay. Uh, Carissa, you have your hand up again. Uh, skip me for now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I should have put it down. I might circle back. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Chuck? Yeah. Uh, you know, Tina, the Portland really is a sort of outside of Portland and inside too. It's seen as a blemish in Oregon. Um, things just aren't going right there for in a lot of fronts. Um, and that's obviously, I think, pretty clearly one of the reasons Betsy Johnson got into the race. So why do you think someone from Portland is the best shot of taking it and beating Betsy, um, who may be the strongest candidate outside the Democratic candidates? Mm. Well, I, I live in North Portland, but I, I feel like I've been a state leader for the last nine years trying to make the entire state successful. Um, but I'm sure people are gonna say, you know, I'm from Portland. So I'm hopefully I will do a good job telling people what I have done for the entire state as, as Speaker of the House. As it relates to Portland, I'm like, I see it, I live here. It's, we've, it's a humanitarian crisis with the number of people who are living in tents or in their cars um, in our community. And it is a statewide issue. Looks a little different in some places, but it is there everywhere. And that is ultimately a housing supply issue. But in the short term, as governor, right from the get-go, I'm gonna put a special team together to work regionally to talk about what local communities need. For years, the state, up until only about five years ago, had been like, it's mostly the local government tax. This is the local government issue, providing services for people who are experiencing homelessness, not our problem. I haven't believed that. I've been pushing hard from the state. There's more we can do. And I do think it's helping convene conversations. I mean, you know what it's like at the local level. It's sometimes very difficult to have a conversation about where do we put a managed village where people who need to get stable and get into more um, transitional and permanent housing, where are they going to go, right? We have to 
We have to be honest about that and work together to find more stability for people so they can get into permanent housing. We need to make sure mental health supports are there because when you've been on the street, you're going to have, even if you did it before, you're probably going to have some issues, right? We have to support people to get stable, to get into permanent housing. And we need different ideas. That's why I supported Project Turnkey, which was an effort at the beginning of the pandemic to take motels who were kind of had no business, buying them up, converting them into transitional shelters. In only seven months, with around $75 million, we increased shelter capacity and transitional housing capacity by 20% in the state. There's another 50 million coming after the legislature to do a more Project Turnkey uh, sites around the state. 19 new transitional shelters in 13 counties in only seven months. That's the kind of urgency we have to bring to this. And I have a lot of faith that we're turning the corner in Portland, but right now it is very hard. Uh, one of the things we have to do is, you know, frankly, just pick up some trash too. Um, we got to get trash picked up. We have to have more sanitary environments um, around tent uh, encampments. So there's a lot of work to do. And as governor, I'm not going to let the mayor or any of the local leaders off the hook. Um, we all have to figure this out. Thanks. April or Tom, did you have another question? Sorry, I didn't want to unmute. Um, I, I, not really a question. I'm sure I'm going to suggest something you've already thought of, but just listening to you, Tom and I are progressive liberal timber farmers, which I can't imagine we're the only ones, but I was just thinking how, because I follow a lot of the timber people and timber movements in Oregon, how important it would be for you to really work on appealing to that side of our state. Because I, I mean, we always vote Democrat and, and we will, but I'd love to see more. I, I Anyway, I just think it's an interesting situation that they're so set in their Republican voting. And I don't think it's necessarily, um, I'd love to see a, a Democrat appeal to them a little bit more somehow. So I guess a suggestion, but I'm sure something you're already working on. <laughs> well, um, well um, definitely work on that. And I'm just saying, I'll work with anybody, talk with anyone, go anywhere to have conversations. Um, uh, I mean, I know how to call the head of Timber Unity if, if I want to have a conversation. I really do believe in reaching out to everybody because we are all in this together. I really do believe that. So thank you for that suggestion. You're, I, I look forward to some suggestions of people you think I should talk to because um, sometimes you need people to guide you in the right direction. So let me know. Anybody else? Um, Charles, do you have your hand up? I'd like to ask Tina what her relationship is with our congressional delegation. I, I think it's solid. I've, I, you know, I've served with um, several of them in the legislature, well, at least two of them in the legislature, and um, and feel well, three: Merkley, Bonamici, Schrader. Um, and I think they do a solid job for us. Uh, they work really hard. I think it's a very hard job. I'm glad they're fighting every day to to speak up for Oregonians, but also just make sure Congress is, is working. Um, it's very challenging, but um, yeah, I, I consider them friends and allies. And of course we'll have, um, we have two new, you know, we'll have at least one new member with our new seat, so. I'm, I'm mostly interested in uh, how you see the uh, congressional delegation uh, helping the programs that you're going to provide leadership to in the state. Yeah. Well, you know, what's really interesting is, as someone who's um, been able to talk with leaders in other states, I do think our congressional delegation on the Democratic side, although I have a perfectly good relationship with uh, Congressman Bentz, um, has worked really closely with legislative leaders. And I would, because we will have to get help from our federal government to do some of the things we wanna do. For example, we're up for uh, a new waiver on our, on our Medicaid program here for the Oregon Health Plan. We need help from the federal government to make sure we have the flexibility we need to do the coordinated care that we are currently um, doing here in the state of Oregon. So 
as governor, I will have um, a federal agenda with our colleagues, um, with my colleagues in DC. We, I think we do really work hard to work together and I have a strong relationship, particularly with our senators um, and, you know, representative our Congresswoman Bonamici and I have worked together. I would say those are probably my strong, well, Congressman Blumenauer, he is my Congressman. Um, so I'm just glad they're there fighting every day. It's hard work. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, anybody, I, Chris, I'm not sure if you have your hand up now or not. Yes, this time was on purpose. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have a question about, I think it was like 2017, 2018, there was a tax law repealed the Oregon tax haven law, I think. Um, and please correct me if that's already been um, fixed and changed back or re-legislated. Um, but if it has not, what are your plans as governor to correct that um, mistake? Thank you for asking about that. I, my memory is failing me. We had a tax haven. I supported the legislation to, you know, keep people from, you know, the tax havens that people were sending money overseas and not paying state taxes. And we did raise some revenue from that. And then I believe there was a change at the federal level that it required us to change something we were doing, but I, I will have to go back and look, um, but generally support the idea of making sure um, companies who operate in Oregon are paying their fair share in Oregon. So I don't have to tell I thought something changed perhaps with the Trump tax cuts that made something we were doing not viable anymore. But. Yeah, I think that's what it was, um, but it, it wasn't great for Oregon. And so I was mm -hmm. hoping that maybe there was something that Oregon was working on to fix it. Well, I'm certainly open to that. I'd have to go back and, and, and look at that, but thanks for bringing that up. We, we repealed it, but I don't think we ever put it back in. Okay. We did have a tax haven thing and it got stopped. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I would be open to revisiting that for sure. Well, um, thank you, Tina, for visiting us. We really appreciate it. And um, the video will go out to the 200 people on our mailing list. So the rest of the group that wasn't able to attend tonight will get to know you too. <laughs>